Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last lecture in the series on, uh, on computational fluid dynamics by Dr. Charles Crosby of the CHPC. And um, you all know the, the rules of the game by now, so no need to, to spend too much time on, <clears throat> on that. Maybe just a reminder uh, to encourage you to, to ask questions. There is still a few book vouchers to, to be won this afternoon and two more tomorrow. So please ask questions and, and, and Charles will then decide which one is the, the best uh, question of the, of the session. So Charles, I know that you prepared some uh, exciting uh, videos for this afternoon showing the, the, the open source uh, possibilities in computational fluid dynamics. So we are very keen to, to see what you are going to share with us this afternoon. If you want to share your screen, you're welcome to start. Thank you, Francesco. So, right. Um, well, I wouldn't know so much about exciting um, because this is getting down to hard tax of making open firm work for you. Uh, remember, at the first lecture, I mentioned that there's an optional assignment of in get open firm installed on your system and then try and run a couple of the uh, tutorial cases. Uh, as those of you who have attempted it would have discovered, uh, getting anything to run in open firm is, well, there's a lot that you've got to learn. So what I'm trying to do with today's lecture, which is going to consist of a series of six short videos, is to basically walk you through the process. I'm assuming you've basically got, got it installed. Um, we could spend a couple of hours just dealing with the installation, but there's a lot of documentation online about how to do that. So what I've done in this case, I've actually just worked my way through um, through some of these videos, um, just to illustrate how you would go about running these tutorial cases and taking a look at the results and trying to point out some of the most obvious features of the code. As before, because um, we're going to be running these videos through in one go, um, at any time, if you've got a question, just uh, put it in the chat box and Andrew will draw my attention to it. And um, we'll pause the video and take it um, and then have it have a bit of a discussion on um, on what you've just asked. Right, you should be able to see that. To install open foam on your own computer is to actually run an installation of Linux on your computer. Generally speaking, uh, open foam will work well with the recent version of Ubuntu. There are also instructions available. At for the you. moment, it's just showing a blank screen for me, Charles. Take a look at the website. Okay, hang on, let's, pa let's pause it. It is shared. Um, and the sound is on at my end. Can uh, can you all confirm? Can you all, uh, all confirm that it's not working for you? It's a little bit out, like out of focus or something. Yeah. But we can see it. That's the. We can hear clearly, but the yeah, the, 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 the video we can't really read. The <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a bit odd. Um, I just want to get into. Um, I think if I switch off my camera, it will reduce the bandwidth requirement um, and that should improve. I've, uh, uh, further on in the video, I've made a point of using larger fonts to make it a bit more readable. I'm just going to stop the stop the sharing for a bit. And then um, I'm stopping my video. And then I shall shortly uh, mute my microphone as well. So let's uh, let's start over again. I hope that that's going to be uh, in more detail. This, I don't think there's much we can do about it. Um, no, this is much better. Thank you very much. Okay, good. We can really read it. Yeah, perfect. Is Thank you very much. Install open foam on your own computer is to actually run an installation of Linux on your computer. Generally speaking, Open Foam will work well with the recent version of Ubuntu. There are also instructions available for installing it on other distributions. Take a look at the website openfoam.com and openfoam.org for instructions on how to install the Linux distribution of your choice. In my case, I've chosen in 
in an attempt to get it to run on a Windows laptop. I have uh, chosen to make use of the Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, into which I've installed a recent version of Ubuntu, which I was able to obtain from the Microsoft App Store. Um, into this uh, Linux distribution, following the instructions from the uh, website, I was able to install OpenFoam. Now there's a little bit of a catch here. The storage used for running the software is not immediately available from Windows. If you want it for some reason, and there's a very good reason why you'd like want to do this, if for some reason you wanted to access your data uh, from Windows, then it's hidden, so you can't really do it. But you can create a directory in Windows and make that available inside your Linux partition. And this is what I've done. I've got two hard drives in this machine and they show up as Mount C and Mount D. Um, in Mount D, I've created a directory called Foam Runs and I have copied the Open Foam tutorial cases. I'll show you where to find them. I've copied into that directory and then I'm setting up a symbolic link from Mount D Foam Runs into my home directory in this Ubuntu machine. So if I now take a look at the directories that I've got available, you'll see there's foam runs. So if I go change directory into foam runs, there are the tutorial cases. So that's quite handy. So we can do the, do the runs here and they're visible in the Linux machine, but they're also visible in the Windows machine. Where did I get the tutorial cases? Well, Linux is installed, sorry, open foam is installed in the opt tree, the opt directory tree. So there's opt open foam 8. Um, under open foam 8, you'll find a directory called tutorials. The other useful things as well here, there's the source files and there's the documentation files. We'll, we'll return to that in, in, in a while. But for now, we're only interested in the tutorials. I've copied these tutorials to a directory on my D drive which I've now made available in my home directory. So we can work from foam runs. Uh, it's handy to do this because this is now visible to both the Linux machine and the Windows machine. Let's go and find one of our simple tutorial cases. I said we would look at some simple tutorial cases and I meant that literally. We will take a, a starting look at a tutorial cases using the simple foam solver. In other words, this is a version of open foam that uses a simple algorithm to solve incompressible flow. And perhaps the simplest of these examples is one called Pitts Daily. You can go and research the history of that name, but it's a form of a backward facing step um, calculation. Uh, when you go into that directory, you'll see the following subdirectories. There's a zero directory, so that contains boundary conditions and initial conditions to start with. Then there's a script called all run, which executes open foam. It creates the mesh and it uh, starts the solution, so it's the solver running. Um, and then there are directories called, called constant. When you're finished running it, there'll be a direct directory called post processing. This is left over from a previous run. And then there's a system directory. We'll take a look in each of these directories to see what the files are. And then there's an odd file which I've added. It's called bananas.foam. Uh, there's a reason for the funny name. Open foam documentation will recommend in order to post process your runs, you should use a script called parafoam that launches the paraview post processing program. Uh, with a reader for open foam files automatically. So if you do that, all an open foam run should be ex, uh, should be post processable very easily. Unfortunately, in th there are limits to what you can achieve uh, with working with a Linux subsystem running under Windows. If you've got a properly configured Linux system, that's exactly the process that you should use. When you're doing this kind of thing, where you're running under another operating system. Uh, three-dimensional program viewing program like a uh, paraview requires a library called OpenGL to do the three-dimensional um, rendering. Um, generally speaking 
you're going to battle to get the drivers to work in a virtual environment like this. It, it can be done, but it's very tricky. And there's a much simpler solution. And this is why I've set it up in such a way that the cases are also visible from, uh, from the Windows directory. Because Paraview runs in a number of operating systems. It'll run in Mac, it'll run in Windows, it'll run in Linux. So we've got a v Windows version running on this particular computer. And we'll just go directly to the foam di runs direct directory and pick up um, the file, the, the case there. But now we're not using the Parafoam interface to tell Paraview to load up an open foam case. So if Paraview is used to post-process an open foam case, it looks in the case directory for a file with the extension .foam. There does not have to be anything in that file. Uh, the file can have any name, but it must have the extension .foam. And when you tell it to read that empty file, it will read the data from the various directories and do the right thing. So all you need is a any file with that extension. And we've kind of standardized and used using bananas.foam because you're not going to use the name bananas for anything else on a computer. When you come to the directory the first time, it's going to be empty. Uh, it's only going to be the minimum number of files and it certainly won't have any visualizable data in it. But this case has been run once before. I've removed most of the files, but it's left some of them behind. And the files that it has left behind includes the files that will show us what the mesh looks like. So that means there's already something that we can read there. So we can switch to Paraview. And we can open that bananas.foam file. I've already moved it into the right directory. So it immediately knows that it's an open foam case and it's actually got a useful extra bit that because it also allows us to read paral parallelized models as well. Um, so it shows us different regions of the mesh. I will just load up all of them. And it gives us an outline of what the geometry looks like. We can rotate it with the mouse to see what it really is. And this is typical of an open foam example case. It's a pseudo 2D case. Um, open foam doesn't have a true 2D mode. It runs all cases in 3D. But you can get a pseudo 2D case by creating a mesh with a thickness of only a single cell. So it's in effect a 2D case. You'll, you've got cells with a finite thickness, but there's nothing happening in the Z direction. Um, and this shows us what the mesh looks like. It's a multi-block mesh. It's done with the utility called block mesh that is included um, in OpenFoam. It reads coordinates from a file, and we'll take a look at those coordinates in a minute. And it creates a mesh from, the, from that, and it sets up the necessary boundary conditions. It identifies the boundary conditions, and then in another set of directories, you can go and specify um, the values that need to be applied to, to those boundaries. So, yeah, so that's what the geometry looks like. It's a uniform flow that comes in there. It passes over a backwards-facing step, and then you'll get a region of recirculating flow here, and it'll exit at this end of the domain. Right, so uh, let's leave that for the moment and let's switch back to uh, this directory here. And we run the script called all run. Um, now, typical of a Linux system, if you just type in all run, uh, it's going to be quite unhappy. It doesn't know what to do with it. Reason is current directory in Linux is not by default included in your path. So you just get to give it, tell it that it's happy that it's in the current directory. So dot forward slash all run and the first thing that it does is it reads the block mesh mesh direct dictionary it creates this very simple mesh and then it starts the solver and the solver is running on this at the moment it'll take a minute or two to run it's a simple case it's not parallelized it's running on a single core so it'll take a few seconds to run As you can imagine, an open source code like OpenFoam is nowhere near as user friendly as. Uh, I've just stopped the stopped the video there for a moment. This is the end of the first one. Any questions uh, about how we got to this stage? Any uncertainty? Things that you'd like me to elaborate on?
Okay, evidently not. Let's proceed. So, fluent or star CCM plus. In fact, you could go so far as to say it's positively user hostile. Nevertheless, if you know what to look for, you can find the necessary information. So it's written log files while it is processing. Uh, the script or run really only executed two instructions. One is to build the mesh with um, the command block mesh, and it's written the output of that to a log file. And the other one has been to actually run the solver with a log file called log.simplefoam. So let's take a look at log.blockmesh. So we, we can view it with the command less log.blockmesh. And it tells us which version of OpenFoam we're running. It tells us um, where it's got the information from. It's give, giving us some information about the host we're running on and a few other things. And then come the actual progress of working through generating a block mesh. Now a simple very small block mesh like this generates in a fraction of a second so this is fairly trivial. You can go very complex on blocks and block meshes. It's quite an art in its own right but let's leave that for now. Then there is the log file for the solver. So let's take a look at log.simplefoam. A lot more information here because it's been iterating. It's got the same kind of header information that you may want to monitor. And then it tells you a few things about what it's found when it looked for files in its directories. And it's writing output for each. It's it's calling it a time step, but because SimpleFoam is actually a steady solver, it's actually an iteration. It's not really a time. So it's quite useful in the sense that it also gives us the amount of time that has elapsed clock time that is elapsed since it's elapsed since it started the calculation. So it's run for a total, I think, of 287 iterations before it converged. And there it there we go it's reached the convergence and, and then it wrote the output to the directory 287 which is the index of the iteration at which it reached convergence so you can also see this we've got th three new directories time directories 100 200 287 because it was set to write iterations at 100 iteration intervals and i'll show you in a minute where you get that information but perhaps it's most useful at this stage to take a look at the results so we can go back to Paraview and let's load up bananas.foam again. There's more information now because there's also the solutions uh, of the solution variables that are available now. But we don't actually need to read all these regions of the mesh. Uh, we should really just be able to do the front and the back because it's a two dimensional case. Uh, the internal cells will be the same as the front and the back and the others are just thin, cell, thin cells that are not worth looking at. So we can apply that and it's coming up immediately with a plot of the pressure. So we can select the variable that we want to look at. So there's the velocity. So you can see a region of high velocity and a region of low velocity. But there were three di directories. And it's defaulted to the first one after zero. So this is the solution at time 100, but we can step it to time 287 when it reached convergence. And you can see there was a slight change in the, in the flow field. So it's typical of a, let's call it a heat map, a color contour plot. Uh, let's walk through Paraview a little bit. Uh, Paraview is a tremendously valuable um, tool for lots of simulation results, not just fluid dynamic simulation, and it's worth getting to know it properly. Now, it may seem a little bit strange to start talking about Paraview before we've got into much depth with open foam, but consistent with the way I do things, I bring them in where I think uh, it's worth talking about them. Paraview is a remarkable piece of software. Uh, the development was funded uh, largely by the American government, but it is open source and it is available to anybody in the world. Um, there's another piece of software which does more or less the same thing as Paraview, and that's called Visit, but we'll look at the Visit website in a little while. The Paraview.org website is where you go to find Paraview for your platform, 
And yes, just a couple of examples of um, visualizations of various things in physics uh, done with Paraview. Um, it's called Paraview because it's inherently parallel. Um, the architecture is designed in such a way that you can use it to visualize extremely large data sets, much m larger than you could hope to deal with on a simple desktop computer. Uh, we have a com tot we have a web page uh, on our on our wiki at the Center of High Performance Computing devoted to setting up and running Paraview in parallel. Uh, for example, it's entirely possible to run just the front end, the graphics bit that you can see in the interface, on a cheap laptop at home over a relatively slow internet connection, and at the back end on the co high performance computing cluster. You could use one or more nodes with lots of cores actually doing the heavy lift crunching of the numerical data to generate the images. That's how Paraview is intended to be used. It's intended to be used in a uh, client-server kind of way. However, it runs very nicely just as a simple desktop, desktop application as well. And it would be almost unthinkable to use Paraview, uh, sorry, to use OpenFoam without Paraview. Uh, we'll get into some of the details of what you can do with, uh, with Paraview in a minute. We'll just demonstrate a couple of the nice images that came from uh, various disciplines where it's been used. So bear in mind, even if you s in the theoretical or other physics field, and you never actually work with fluid dynamics, chances are very good. At some stage, you'll have to deal with data in multiple dimensions and time that you would like to visualize. And certainly Paraview is a tool that you absolutely need to have in your toolbox. Um, apart from Paraview, there's another code called Visit. Uh, Visit is also an American code. Um, it does more or less exactly the same thing as Paraview, but it does it in a somewhat different way. And in fact, the two interfaces are so different that it's very difficult to convert from the one to the other. Um, Visit will read open foam uh, cases and visualize it very well, but I don't know actually actually of anybody doing it. Um, everybody that I know using um, open foam work with Paraview, but you could certainly work with Visit and it would work well. Anyway, let's get back to Paraview. It's what the interface looks like. It supports a very large number of file formats. If you were to open a case, it's generally smart enough to recognize that a .foam case, for example, is an open foam file, but it can recognize a whole bunch of other formats as well. You can just quickly scroll down here. It's a large variety of file formats, some of them which are actually intended for other software, such as TechPlot and Insight, which can be viewed with um, Paraview. It works in a kind of hierarchical way. It gives you a, a tree here, and then you can do something to the thing that you've selected in the tree. So at this stage, we're just getting a surface plot, and we're doing it on the velocity magnitude of the velocity vector, but we're doing it on the points. Remember, we're dealing with finite volume cells here, so really the data is stored as cell values. Now, if the grid's fine enough, you don't see the difference. But if you zoom in a little bit, you can see it's colored in a constant way per cell, whereas if we view it per point, it interpolates it and smooths it. It doesn't actually make it any more precise. It just gives you an image which is prob probably a bit more pleasing. You may have to decide, uh, make up your own mind uh, whether it's appropriate for you to do it that way. There's a whole bunch of more or less sophisticated settings that you can do here. One of them is that it tends to come up by default with a perspective. So in other words, if we were to rotate this model with the mouse, uh, you'll see it's well the bits that are close to the eye or the camera are larger than the, than the bits that are far away. This may not be how you want to see it. So you can set it to parallel projection. So that may look a little bit unnatural, but everything is now perpendicular and orthogonal 
as you would expect to see it if you didn't take into account the perspective. So that's a minor setting. There are quite a few other settings here that you, ca that you can experiment with. Uh, color maps. Uh, there's quite a lot of controversy about what kind of color map really represents a value very nicely. This is a relatively poor color map. It just goes from red to blue with a gradual change in between. Um, and it's not particularly spectacular, but there are those who will argue that it's simple and direct to, in, uh, to interpret. And in fact, you should, could do just as well with just a black and white color map because it's very clear uh, where in the scale that color would be. But it's easy enough to change your color map. Um, there would be a monochrome color map. And you can see what I mean. It's pretty obvious which are the high speed bits and which are the low speed bits. Remember, we're talking about the velocity of the, uh, the magnitude of the velocity vector. Uh, we can change to a brighter kind of color scheme, which perhaps gives us more information because it's got more colors. It's got the yellows and the uh, and the greens in, in as well. So you, you can pick out more detail. There's a lot of there's a big whole science involved in selecting a color map that really works for you. Uh, important to realize with Paraview, um, there's generally a way to do things. You may just need to look for it a little bit. It's got a thing called filters. And you take an alphabetical lift of the filters, you can see there's an awful lot of things that you can do here. The kind of thing that you do very often is you can extract a block. So if you've got a model which has got a lot, lot of parts, you can now at this stage select only some some of that. Uh, then there are some things which actually pop up here in a uh, menu directly without having to go to the filters, but they're also available from the filters. And this is where you would find, for example, velocity vectors. Now, for reasons best known to themselves, the developers of the software did not use the expression velocity vectors for plotting vector properties, they use the expression glyph. So we can set a glyph on these front and back surfaces. The glyph type in this case will be an arrow, so that will give us a vector. Um, we're going to scale it by the velocity magnitude. Well, let's take a look, see what it looks like. Uh, rather infuriatingly, it makes a habit of not auto-scaling very intelligently. So you've nearly always got to experiment to find a scale factor that gives you an image that is easy to understand. Um, it's scaled the length of the vector um, by the velocity, but not the color. The color is being scaled by the pressure, but that's easy enough to change. You can do it up here. Well, it would be if uh, it was available in that list. It's not immediately obvious why it isn't. Uh, let's uh, make give it a constant color. It may be a little bit easier to interpret that way. Let's switch off the underlying model. And you should be able now to recognize that in this case, we've got a recirculating flow here. So um, you can change your settings here to get you a vector plot which represents the flow field in a way that's easy to interpret. Let's get rid of that and go back to our plane with the uh, color map of the velocity. Velocity is a vector and in this case we're plotting the magnitude of the velocity vector we could also have done it by components. So there's the X direction, the horizontal direction component of the velocity vector, which looks much the same because this flow is predominantly horizontal. But if you were to plot the Y direction vector magnitude, you would see that it looks rather different. Here you've got an upwards flow, and there you've got a downwards flow because it's, it's given us negative values. Let's go back to the magnitude. Streamlines may be a very useful way of viewing a flow field. But 
a streamline is a volume property and we've only loaded up the front and back surfaces here so in order to make the volume data available so that we could plot streamlines we would need the um, internal mesh data to become available now in this case it doesn't actually make any difference because it's a um, it's a mesh that's only a single cell in, th in thickness so but we're now representing it by the internal mesh so if we take a look at the uh, model edge on you can see that it's or single cell um, thick. Let's get back to the face on view and let's start thinking how we would go about visualizing streamlines. So there's the tool that we can use to release streamlines, a stream tracer. So it gives us a couple of different options, so stream properties. Uh, we are released, well, we can choose to release from a single point. Um, a number of uh, of stream streamlines over a dist uh, in a in a distance from that point, or we can do it from the line. So the line is actually the logical one, and it would be logical to align this this line with a y-axis. Uh, so we can move this line backwards and forwards. Um, take a look. It's no use if it sits over there. It's got to be within the domain so you've got to be careful when you're moving things that are um, three-dimensional we'd like to position the line so that it's in the middle of this flow domain in the z direction but how do we find that value well if we go back to our initial part that we've loaded which is the original bit in the tree and if we go to the information it'll give us the z range so we see here that z ranges from minus half a millimeter to plus half a millimeter assuming that these are in meters so if we set z, z to zero it'll be exactly in the middle so we can deal with that so stream tracer properties we've set z to zero um, and it's being released the stream tracer is released in this case well let's use a value of 0 0.1 so we can put in exact values to make sure that we have it where we want and it goes from basically minus one inch to plus one inch which is the distance from the top uh, top to the bottom uh, how many streamlines are we going to release well it's set here to a thousand well that's going to take a while to compute let's just use 20. And there we go so for now it's automatically switched off the um, the surfaces so that we can make see the see the streamlines more clearly uh, one can you know one can one can do various ways of there are various ways of extracting extra geometric information to orient yourself so you could go to that original part for example um, you could also make sure that you load up the inlet the lower wall the outlet and the upper wall these are the thin edges they're not visible now but from this we could alphabetic extract the block which would be those so-called patches and it should make them available so they're showing up now as or we make them in a, in a solid color so they may be a little bit more visible so they give us the boundaries of our domain and we can see our streamline uh, pattern uh, we have to click on the stream tracer to make that line visible again uh, we could choose to move this line further to the left so let's put it at 0 to 5 and 0 to 5 and let's use 40 streamlines which will give us a bit more information I've experimented a little bit to make our streamlines maybe be a little bit more visible so I've uh, positioned the streamline so that it releases the streamline from a position which more or less aligns with the center 
of this region of recirculating flow. Uh, I've made it 40 streamlines. I've also given them a line width of two and I've also colored, colored it by the velocity using the rather brighter color map. So as you can see, you've got a lot of parameters that you can tune to give you the kind of information that you would like to get from your solution. Uh, after a while, you discover what kind of measures you should take to give you a, um, a good visualization. So I've now used a slightly different trick to get us a bit more information out of this flow field. And I've made use of something which is an optional uh, form of visualization, which is a surface line integral convolution. It's called, in other words, abbreviated with a surface lick. I did it by uploading all the parts and then extracting only the front and back surfaces. So I've hidden the other bits that we had visible before, such as a stream tracer. And I've changed from the surface representation where we get this this this, this, uh, this heat map kind of color plot and I've changed to the surface line integral convolution and we get what would effectively be oil streak lines on a surface in other words these are lines along a plane that follow the vector that we've selected and it's colored by the velocity vector when you're dealing with three-dimensional flows it's actually very often very useful to plot the surface shear stress this way. So it, it gives us some extra information. So for example, what it's given us here is an indication that there is a small region of counter-rotating vortex right in the corner here. And experimental results back this up. You do tend to get this, but it's very dependent on the turbulence model that you select for this particular case. Now, with this particular case, the spits daily, it gives us the option of changing the turbulence model very easily. I'll show you in the input files what that looks like. Uh, at this stage, I would like to pause the video um, because we're trying to, I think, make these lectures a little bit more general uh, to people. In other words, we're showing you ParaView as a way of interpreting open foam results. But as I've mentioned um, earlier in the lecture, uh, Paraview works for all kinds of physics, and I'm rather assuming that most of you are postgraduate students working in other fields of physics. So what I'd like to know is who of you are actually working with a three-dimensional or two-dimensional data sets, and who of you are actually using a tool like Paraview to visualize that data? Um, please use the microphone or type in the chat box. Uh, we'd love to know that. Give you a couple of seconds to, to reply. Anybody want to speak? Is anybody alive? Evidently not. I think, Francesca, you, well, you owe me an explanation how your theoretical physics students are not dealing with, uh, with volume, volume fields. Right, let's proceed with the videos. Let's now take a walk through the various open foam directories and the files contained in them. It's probably best to start with the constant directory. You can see that up there. So let's change into that directory. Take a look at the files in there. There's a subdirectory, polymesh, which contains the mesh. Maybe we should look at that first. So there are a number of files here. They're all written by the mesh generation program, in this case, block mesh. The ones we're interested in is really just the boundary file. Um, the others, the faces, neighbor, owner, and points files, that's just sets, sets of point data. It's not really e logic to interpret that for a person but the boundary file is important so let's just list it quickly so less boundary and this contains a list of the five faces 
in our grid with their names and types. So there's an inlet boundary condition, inlet boundary, which is called, which has got a type of patch. Outlet is also a patch. The upper walls and lower walls are walls, which is what you'd expect. And then there's the special case for the pseudo 2D case, which is empty. That's the front and back faces. We've backed up one level here, so we're in the constant directory, and here there are two files that are of interest to us immediately. Momentum transport and transport properties. Let's take a look at the momentum transport file first. I've opened it up in an editor for convenience. So first of all, it's telling us that the simulation type is ROS. That's Reynolds, Av Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes. And then we can select the appropriate Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes turbulence model. So this file is where you select the turbulence model. In fact, you can set the turbulence completely off. You can replace that word on with off, and then we'll get a laminar solution. We're not going to do that, but you can see that this particular file has been commented to the um, to make the point that it's been tested with a range of two equation turbulence models. So when we run it next time, I want to see what the V2F turbulence model does. The V2F is a relatively recent turbulence model development. And like all improvements on turbulence models, it should give us a little bit more detail in the flow. Then um, the other file in this directory is the transport properties file. So let's take a look at the transport properties file. That's got very little information. What it should really be giving us is the viscosity and the density of the fluid. Now we're working with incompressible air. And instead of working with the dynamic viscosity, we're working with the kin kin kinematic kinematic viscosity, which is basically, oh, I'd better check on that, it's the uh, viscosity divided by the density. So there's only a single number because it's an incompressible flow, neither the viscosity nor the density is going to change. Right, I just needed to check, of course, kinematic viscosity is the dynamic viscosity, which is normally expressed with the Greek letter mu divided by the density, Greek letter rho. So in this case, the kinematic viscosity is nu, uh, with, it, with the, the, the Greek letter nu with nu. Um, so this encapsulates both the density and the viscosity for an incompressible flow. So I've backed up one level of directory and then changed to the system directory. So there are four important files in this particular system directory. Uh, there's the block mesh di dictionary, which was used for mesh generation. There's a very important control dictionary, which is your overall control of the solution. And then the finite volume schemes and the finite volume solution. Uh, there's also a script for generating streamlines for post-processing, but that's not universally required. These three files, control dict, every schemes and every solution, you'll find in every open foam case. Uh, you'll also find a block mesh dictionary if the mesh was generated with block mesh. Let's take a look at the control dictionary. Uh, we specify the solver, in this case, simple foam. We tell it to start from the start time, which we specify there. You see, this you can change this to restart an existing calculation. You would start from latest time. And in fact, it's good practice always to start from latest time, because if the latest time is zero, it'll simply start from there. And then stop at the end time, which is the end time there. It's using the word time. It's really for a simple flow, so simple foam solution. This is just iteration. So these are integer numbers. If it was a transient simulation, these would be times, uh, decimal times and seconds. Delta T by definition for an integer inter iteration would be one. It can, can't be anything else. But for a transient calculation, it would of course be it would of course be different. Then we can define how we want to output. Um, typically, a time step. Every 100 iterations, it should write an output file. And purge write. This is how many files does it keep. So we'll, I do this normally. I set that to 3. So it only keeps the last files. It'll, it stops an accumulation of too much um, data. You can save the files in ASCII format so that you can read them easily. Or you can change that to a binary format which makes them compact and faster, but you can't read them yourself. How many significant digits? Uh, some compression settings format settings. These are things you don't, wouldn't need, generally need to change. And this is one of OpenFoam's coolest features. Runtime modifiable true. This means that at any time while the solution's running, 
you can go into the files and change some of the parameters. Now you can't do something radical probably like switching the turbulence model, but you can certainly change the time step size, the um, iteration at which you're going to end, and you can even change the uh, some of the, f the solution parameters in the, in the next two files. And then, then you get a function. So this is optional, function section which is optional. In this case, it's uh, writing it's writing some outputs for um, post processing. Let's just save that. We're actually um, going to look at the EV solution files now. So this is now where you make some choices of how you're going to be solving the equations. So we'll use these solvers for the various variables. So we're using a, uh, an a general algebraic multigrid solver for the pressure equation. The pressure equation is the one that takes far, by far the most time and then using a, a much easier, simpler solver for the other variables. Then some control parameters. These are dependent on the solution algorithm and then some under relaxation factors to stabilize the equations. And then the schemes file. This is where you select your differencing schemes. So this is not immediately obvious. You're going to have to go and read up what these mean. But basically that would be a uh, central differencing. There's no differencing in time because we're using a steady state. Normally you'd use implicit different differencing for a transient solution. Um, and then this is the one that makes such a difference to the stability of the calculation, which is the schemes used for the convection terms. So, and it's mostly important what you do with the velocity vector. In this case, it's using the bounded Gauss linear upwind grad U scheme so there's a, that's a mouthful but basically that's a stabilized second order upwind scheme uh, if you wanted a simpler scheme with less accuracy but more stability you would simply use gauss upwind uh, the some of the nomenclature should be should be similar to what you should remember from fluent because we remember we had uh, the gauss schemes as well there's there um, and then some other schemes here Generally speaking, you don't need to touch this. Uh, but this is the important one if you need to stabilize a calculation. Uh, it's using a second order scheme for the turbulence terms. It's a little bit arguable whether it should be using second order upwind schemes or whether it should be using um, just a first order scheme. Uh, nevertheless, this works for this case. Um, you'll see here there's, there's some variables here that we're not using. So we were using just a simple k epsilon turbulence model. So omega and v2 were not used at all in our calculation. But if we now change the turbulence model, um, these schemes will come into use. If you, if you are going to use a, a variable, you have to specify schemes for it. Um, but it does no harm to have the settings in here for a scheme that you're not using. Remember that I said that not only is open foam possibly not uh, really user friendly, but actually actively user hostile. Well, the fact that you've got to go and edit all these individual files is an indication of that. It's not as bad as it looks. It's difficult to get going, but once you've got going with it, um, it's quite a powerful method. You can find parametric or automatic ways of changing files to what you want them to be. You can copy existing files to build new ones. But it can be a little bit tedious to work through all these files. Uh, if you want a very convenient graphics interface to run your software, you've got to pay some money and buy some commercial software. You can also buy um, commercial, commercially marketed interfaces for open firm, but they do cost serious money. Right, so the zero directory, that's the boundary conditions directory and initial conditions directory for all your variables. And there's a file for each variable. So velocity, and these are the turbulence properties, and there's the pressure. So once again, you've got a file for all the variables that you might be using. So we've only been using the k epsilon model, so not all of these terms have been in use. Uh, not all these uh, files have been in use. So it does no harm to have them there if they're not used. But if you are going to use them, they have to be there. The method will crash um, if you don't have them. So let's take a look at some of those files. Uh, there are ways of making these files a little bit easier to handle, but they are just tedious. Um, right, at the top of the file you have the dimensions of, um, of the variable. So 
I can tell you there immediately that that is length and that is time because we're dealing with velocity so units are meters per second so it's the first power of the length and the minus one power of uh, of time so meters per second we're starting off with a uniform flow field of zero flow it's stationary flow and then we're specifying an inlet boundary condition with 10, me 10 meters per second in the in uh, inlet direction outlet is a zero gradient and you've got logical snow slip boundaries or empty boundaries for for the other boundaries and so you can do the same thing for all the other um, parameters generally speaking the ones the, the ones that you have to get right are the um, velocity boundary conditions but then your, your turbulence terms may also be important so this is the k part of the k epsilon uh, turbulence model and importantly it uses a wall function um, at the boundaries it's a way of basically making your turbulence model understand what's happening with the boundary layer so various variables if you are going to be using those turbulence models your pressure typical for an incompressible flow you'll specify an inlet velocity boundary condition but a zero gradient for the pressure at the inlet and then you specify at the outlet a fixed value for the pressure in this case zero because it's incompressible flow we just need to give it some arbitrary value and then the velocity at the outlet will be typically be a zero gradient boundary condition you've got to be quite careful about over specifying these boundary conditions um, in an incompressible flow you can easily run into trouble for example if you specify a value for the pressure and the velocity at the same boundary there are other more sophisticated boundaries that can take care of far field boundaries and compressible flows uh, you can go and look in some of the other tutorial cases to find those righto so this gives us just a very very brief overview of the files there's a lot of information in these files you've got to take your time to work through them but i'm trying to get across to you if you're starting to use open foam for the first time you've got to go and look at these files individually and edit them and understand what they mean and then experiment just have a look at what look to see what happens if you change them most most typically the program will crash if you've made a syntax error in the files but usefully in the output files on the output it will tell you what the allow it most probably tell you what the allowed vi values would have been for that variable I want to run this case again but I'm going to do it slightly differently I'm going to do it step by step I'm not going to hide the processes from you by running the all run script I'm going to do it all off the command line and I'm also going to show you how to do it in parallel it's a little bit silly to do this particular case in parallel because it's far too small for that uh, to benefit from parallel processing and this particular computer is a very old two core laptop so it doesn't have that much performance in parallel anyway but we're just trying to demonstrate the process first of all if you want to run parallel you need one additional file which is the decompose uh, um, dic dic dictionary it's in the system directory so if we list the system directory now i've gone and copied that file from another case you can now see there's a decompose par dict file when we take a look at the decompose par dict file uh, we can see it's got a couple of things here most importantly number of subdomains we can only run two-way parallel on this computer so we'll run two-way parallel on it the method it's given here is pt scotch for various reasons that's not appropriate here we'll just use the scotch decomposition that's a fairly simple but efficient way of decomposing a parallel case uh, these coefficients are not important for this case, this scheme if you we were for example going to use a hierarchical decomposition scheme you would have needed to supply appropriate coefficients uh, let's uh, save that file i've deleted the mesh so if we take a look in the constant um, poly mesh directory there is now nothing there in order to um, uh, to to generate the mesh we would have to run block mesh and this is the block mesh dictionary file it's as tedious as it gets basically you're putting in a range of corner vertices um, and then you're defining hexa hexahedral blocks built up from these corner vertices with a certain number of grid cell spacing um, yes this is not particularly difficult is it is as tedious as anything it's very very manual you really don't want to do this manually um, you want to develop some kind of script to build a parametric series of grids for you for example if you're going to make extensive use 
of block mesh. Nevertheless, um, this has been set up for us so we can just use it. So we can run block mesh. And now it's not writing the logs to file, it's actually writing them to the screen. And it tells us that it's generated a five block mesh with um, these boundary conditions. So now if we had a look in the constant polymesh di uh, directory, we'll see that those files have been newly generated. So we're not ready to run parallel yet. In order to run parallel, we've actually got to decompose this case. So we do a decompose par, and anyway, it's decomposed for parallel processing. So it reads in the grid, divides it up into the two blocks for parallel processing. You can use many more than two blocks if you've got a powerful computer or you've got a distributed parallel computer. We've run it up to a little bit over 3,000 processes on, um, on Lengau. Right, so let's take a look at what we've got now. We've got two new directories. There's a processor zero directory and a processor one directory. What's in those directories? Well, there's a constant directory, which has got the parameters as before, most notably the mesh. But then also there's a zero time uh, dictionary, which has got the boundary conditions for that particular patch. OpenFoam differs from nearly all other software CFD software products when it does the parallel processing. Most of the other methods will store the entire case in a single file. Then when you start up the run for parallel processing, the first step will be to decompose the case into a number of domains. It will partition that out to the various processes that are going to be running them. And it will run the case and at the end of the case, it will put it all together again. OpenFoam does not work like that. You have to explicitly decompose the case and write it out to file. Then you run it in parallel and the outputs are also written out in the individual processor directories. And then at the end, uh, you have to reassemble it with a reconstruct bar uh, command. It does essentially the same thing as these other codes do, but it does it explicitly to disk. It's got some, and some advantages and it's got some disadvantages. One of the advantages is that you can actually do it a parallel post-processing with Paraview um, by addressing the, the separate partitions on disk. That's beyond the scope of this lecture, but it is a way of handling very large cases efficiently. Um, it leads to very large directories, unfortunately, but it also leads to very high I.O. performance if you've got a, a file storage system like the Lustre storage system on our HPC cluster, which can handle multiple writes by multiple processes and nodes at the same time. If you're running over more than one node, it also means that those nodes have to share a file system. Now in a high performance computing cluster, that's always the case. If you're running a cluster of workstations in your office, you have to go and do that setup yourself with some kind of network file system. Right, so we've got the processor directories and now we can run uh, the solver. So we do it with an MPI run command. So MPI, the message passing, in passing interface, MPI run minus NP2. So we're running over two processors. Simple foam is the solver. And most importantly, you must have this flag. If you don't, you're in trouble. Minus parallel tells it launch NP number of instances, but parcel out the work to them separately. If you omit the minus parallel, and we've all done it many times, what you get is n number of parallel executions of the of the same serial job. So you very quickly overload your machine, overload the memory, and the thing crashes and dies. So we can just hit that. And away it goes. It's now running in parallel. The case is still uh, running happily along. Um, we've changed the turbulence model. So by doing that, we've also changed the convergence. For the K-Epsilon turbulence model, we reached convergence in only 287 iterations. We're already up to 900 iterations, and it has not finished, finished yet. So there's things that are getting resolved with this turbulence model, which is slowing down the convergence. Um, what we're looking at here is just the processor zero directory. And we can see that it is writing out a 
set of output files every 100 iterations and deleting the older ones. So as soon as it gets to 1200, it'll delete 900, etc. Here's our activity monitor. So this is a dual-core laptop uh, with hyper-threading. So we're using the two physical cores to do the processing. So it's showing a CPU activity of around 72%. If you were only using a single processor core, you'd have seen 25%. So it's doing 50% of processor capacity is going into the CFD solution and the other 20% of the, of the hyperthread is presumably being used to run the virtual environment. So it's making better use of the computing resources on this particular machine. Um, it's not particularly handy at this stage to observe the um, output because it's flashing past so fast. It's better idea. It's, it's sometimes a good idea just to redirect those to file, um, so that you don't slow down the uh, the run simply due to output going to screen all the time. We've set it to run to a total of two thousand iterations, and it is about to finish very shortly. Okay, it's finished. Here we go, it's finalizing uh, the parallel run. Let's take a look at what we've got. There's a post-processing directory as before. We're not going to worry about that now. Let's take a look in processor zero. Well, we should see exactly the same the same as we did when we uh, looked at it with the Windows File Explorer. So we can actually view this case as is. We can reconstruct it with, with a command reconstruct bar. But I'm going to demonstrate to you how to view it with Paraview as it is decomposed at the moment. So let's bring up Paraview again as before. Let's open bananas.foam. But we'll select the decomposed case. And well, let's just take a look at the front and back. So it's loaded up the most recent, uh, th the the oldest of the um, time st time steps uh, currently available, which is 1800. We can take it all the way to 2000 to get the um, the old the old the last one. So that's looking at pressure. Let's take a look at the velocity magnitude. So that's what the velocity magnitude looks like. It's not vastly different to what we had before. Uh, Let's um, view it as a surface line integral convolution, see if the flow pattern has changed. Well, it hasn't changed enormously, but the length of the recirculation has increased. So that's a result of the change in turbulence model. And it's also definitely increased the size of the secondary recirculation region. If you had the mesh fine enough in that corner, you would have even have found a tertia tertiary vortex going the other, other way again. So um, useful, useful lessons learned from this particular part is the process of doing the command step by step, um, changing the files so that you can have parallel processing, launching it in parallel, and decomposing the case before you do that. Um, under normal conditions, we will typically also do a reconstruct, reconstruct bar we could do just the latest time and then it'll do only the 2000 directory this should not take long so now take a look at our directories we still got the processor directories but now we've actually got the results combined into the 2000 um, time step directory so far we've mostly considered Simple geometries, uh, incompressible flows, academic kind of problems. But don't make the mistake of thinking that that's what OpenFoam is limited to. These are just the tutorial cases for the steady state simple foam solutions. And we're going to take a quick look at two of these which might be of interest to us. One is the turbine sighting case and the other one is the wind around buildings case. So let's go 
to the turbine sightings case. It's a case as all the others, but this one is different. Um, this is going to use snappy hex mesh, a cut cell Cartesian mesh, to give us a mesh over a more complex terrain. It starts this by generating, first of all, um, a block mesh, and then through that block mesh is cut a surface using an STL file of a real world terrain. This then generates a mesh that follows the terrain, and then the inlet boundary conditions are also very different because we're now interested in trying to position wind turbines on a complex terrain in such a way that they'll be exposed to the most favorable wind conditions. Wind is not like wind in a wind tunnel. Real wind has got structure to it. The uh, wind magnitude of the velocity close to the ground is much lower than that higher up. And the turbulence also changes up through this profile. All of this has been measured and there are models available for simulating an atmospheric boundary layer. And this is a good example of how to do this. First of all, let's get this one running. So we started off. It takes a while to generate a snappy hex mesh. So it's first of all doing block mesh. Then it decomposes that because it's going to run um, snappy hex mesh in parallel. And now it's running snappy hex mesh in parallel. While it's doing that, let's fire up Paraview and let's take a look at that terrain. The terrain comes in in the form of an STL file. It's in the constant tri-surface directory under this case. And we can load that up. Takes a moment to load. Uh, let's change the color to a solid color and the representation of the surface with edges. So now we can see what the STL file itself looks like. So as you can see here, this is a real world terrain, whereas the block mesh would be simply a Cartesian, a con Cartesian mesh. We'll let it finish the snappy hex mesh process and then we'll take a look at the mesh. It has finished the snappy hex mesh process and it's now running the solver. So it's now running simple foam in parallel. But while that's happening, we can take a look at the grid that was generated. I've created a bananas.foam file in the uh, case directory for this turbine sighting, sighting case. So we can load that bananas.foam file directory into Paraview. We can take a look at the decomposed case as before. We'll highlight uh, all the mesh regions and we'll load up all the, the flow variables. Right, so it's loaded up the case. Uh, we can go to the most recent time step, which is time step 162. It's converged already. So right, so the first thing I would like to demonstrate is just what the velocity looks like on the inlet boundary. So we'll use the filter. Uh, we've extracted a block before, so it's under recent filters. And let's just pull out the inlet, inlet boundary condition, the inlet boundary. Right, it's a surface here. At the moment, it's plotting the pressure on that. That's, we're not interested in that. Let's do the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity vector. And that now clearly illustrates what we wanted to see. The vo inlet velocity is not uniform. It's very low, close to the ground, and it reaches a maximum, in this case 16 meters per second, at some height above. You can get some of your geometric information by looking over here. You'll see the domain has got a Z range, a height, of a d difference of differential of 560 meters. So from there to there is 560 meters. So it's quite a large case, obviously. Um, and that's where the velocity is at its maximum. So that's quite useful to see. Uh, let's switch that off for a minute. Right, there's our basic case. I, f I really wanted to look at the grid first of all. So um, you don't really want to look at the grid of a volume because it's too confusing. So let's just take out all the surfaces. So we Let's look at all the, the grid on all the um, outer surfaces. And for the sake of making it a little bit more visible, we'll give it a solid color. And we draw its surface with edges. And this is what the snappy hex mesh grid of this surface looks like. So it's mostly a uniform Cartesian mesh that comes from block mesh. mesh but close to the surface, it has refined it. Um, and you've got your grid nodes mapped onto the original STL surface. Let's just switch off the, the grid and go to back to a normal surface. Uh, sometimes it's useful to take a section through a grid. So let's make the 
the original block visible again so let's switch that off now it's not the one we want we actually want to see the whole domain and let's take a section through it we do it with that tool and we can take any section through it it'll tell us what we need to know um, we don't need to see that plane we want to see whole cells we don't want to triangulate them don't worry about what that means what we're going to get now is an extract of what the mesh looks on like on that surface the variable is not at this stage particularly interested interesting to us but we could look at the velocity and we get that kind of thing but let's just switch that off and go back to a solid color and then take a look at the surface with edges and that's what the grid looks like in cross-section they haven't used uh, prism layers here for reasons that i'm not entirely sure are valid but nevertheless we can see what the grid looks like in this cross-sectional plane and the way it's refined close to the surface and follows the surface so this is a very practical very useful case i've used some a lot of the logic um, that was in, um, contained in this case to set up simulations for buildings before now the last simple foam example that we'll look at is the one for wind around buildings uh, it's a practical case it's very useful as used as a template for more sophisticated real world analysis um, in this case the buildings have been saved in the geometry file called buildings.obj.gz so the .obj file is a different kind of faceted representation in order to just look at the geometry with paraview I, I unzipped with gunzip uh, that buildings.obj.gz file so it became, building, became buildings.obj and that's now readable by Paraview right so a hypothetical city landscape with several buildings it's all in faceted geometry so it looks exactly like an STL file it's just a slightly different way of um, of saving the geometry once again this will be used to generate a mesh a far more complex mesh with snappy hex mesh I've recompressed that file so we don't uh, con after we'd finished uh, with the geometry file I launched the script all run which to do all the necessary manipulations to pre produce a mesh with snappy hex mesh and the solver is now running um, we'll take a look at the mesh as it is in its current state so in order to do that get um, paraview to work in this direction you just let's just create that bananas.foam file and we can just do it with touch so that creates a file um, and we can see we're already up to time step number 50 and we've got a bananas.foam file which we can read with paraview so let's open it with that get into the window run buildings bananas.foam uh, it's a it's not a parallel case so let's just load up the entire thing and as before let's extract the block which consists of the ground and the buildings Here we go so we've got a hypothetical urban landscape it's a flat landscape in this case uh, so there's no terrain here it's just the bottom of the mesh um, and it's already giving us some pressures uh, obviously high pressures on the inlet side in real life you'd like to have your inflow and outflow boundaries rather further away than they are at the moment not important at this stage let's take a look and see what the mesh looks like solid color and surface with edges so here we can see where snappy hex mesh is particularly useful uh, this is quite a complex geometry but it's made a very nice but low resolution mesh because this is just a test a mesh for testing purposes or for demonstration and learning it's captured all the details of the urban landscape quite nicely and we can go back to ordinary surfaces and just take a look at the pressure for example and so on um, you should by now get the idea how to, of how to run the software so here's a trick I'd like to show you the solution is running we'd like to stop it but we don't necessarily want to kill it brutally we just want to shut it down very very cleanly um, if we run the command top 
we can see that we've got a simple foam process running there. We can use HTOP to get the same thing in a slightly different format. And we can see the four different virtual cores of, of the computer at work. So we can see that it's still busy. We'd like to stop it at this point. So what we do is we edit the control dict file in the system directory and we change stop at to a little bit of a play on words which is right now but right as in to write a word and if we save that file now it will instruct open foam to stop the simulation right now but to also write out the output file so you can see it's no longer drawing processor power it's finished and if we take a look at the files in the directory we can say we can see that it's finished at, a, at step 112. so that's quite a useful trick to um, to stop the simulation at a given point and get it to write outputs at that point so we've gone back up a couple of levels of directory and we're taking a look at all the incompressible solvers that are available in open film or at least for which there are tutorial cases available and there's a whole bunch of them. We recognize the simple foam, but there are others as well. There's piso foam, which is a transient formulation, and then there's pimple foam, which is a hybrid of simple foam and piso foam. There's ICO foam, which is incompressible foam, which uses a slightly different algorithm. Um, and there are versions of solvers for rotating reference frames. So you can go and take a look at all these examples. We won't do that now. What we will do is to go up another level in the directory tree and see what classes of examples we have. So there's incompressible, um, there's uh, flows with that are compressible, there's flows with combustion. Let's take a look at combustion. So there for example is an interesting one. There are some example cases for fire foam. Uh, fires tend to be treated best with large eddy simulation because of the turbulent nature of the airflow in them. And you've got a small pool fire in two dimensions and a small pool fire in three dimensions. Um, fire foam is a particularly interesting example because it's an illustration of where much of open, soft, open source software today comes from. Fire foam is part of open foam. The source code is part of open foam. But it was developed due to commercial interests. It was... Um, Development of fire foam was funded by a consortium of American industrial insurance companies who needed software that they could own, for which they didn't have to pay money every year, which they could use for fire safety and certification purposes. And this is an interesting example of just how commercial interests actually fund the development of um, open source software. So a lot of open source software is written by professional programmers contracted by large companies who've decided that it's in their interest to share some of their tools with their competitors who also contribute to the development thereof. This is the compressible examples, uh, a couple of solvers there. Compressible solvers has not historically been open foam's strong point. The set of tools is really developed for segregated flow solvers and these are not that applicable to compressible flows. So all these solvers have got some fairly serious shortcomings. Interestingly enough, some of my former CSR colleagues have developed a version of a coupled solver within the Open Foam framework, which can be downloaded and installed separately called HESA, which is a high speed um, compressible solver. Uh, it's very useful for transonic aerodynamics, for example. If you haven't figured it out by now, there's quite a big architectural difference between Open Firm and the commercial products such as Fluent and Star CCM. In the commercial products, you basically got a single solver with a lot of modules that can be added into it. You can choose between compressible and incompressible and various turbulence models and various chemical models, but you're fundamentally running the same program. Open Firm has been developed differently. At its core, it's actually a set of libraries for solving partial differential equations in space um, it can be developed into various flow dynamics or flow dynamic solvers and also other purposes but historically it got developed along the lines of a solver for a particular purpose each time so this is why you've got so many different solvers over the years 
people have done a very good job of making it more and more modular. So now you can switch turbulence on and off in the same code and you can select between different turbulence models and you can select some other models as well. But there are lots of things you cannot bring in because the architecture of the code just does not really allow it. So it's a big difference and you find that it is somewhat limiting in certain cases because some kinds of flow situations cannot be combined easily without going out and writing a special solver which uses logic from other existing solvers. Let's take a very brief look at what open form source code looks like. First of all, this is open source software, so the source code is available to you. In theory, you can take the source code and modify it to fit your purposes. But be warned, this is a piece of software that has been developed in C++, and it is using C++ to the full extent of its capabilities. In other words, it's not trying to write a straight forward solver in C++ because it's cool to do so. It's using C++ because C++'s architecture allows you to do some fairly unusual things. And as a result, there's a lot of abstraction, templating, operator overloading involved. It allows you to write a solver almost in shorthand using scientific notation. We'll take a look at what that looks like in the source code. But it also means that there's a lot of very, very complex things going on underneath it. And these may not be easy to understand or to change if you need to do so. So in the open foam directory, we go to the applications directory and we go to the solvers and we can see here are the different classes of solvers. Right, so this is the simple foam.c file and it is deceptively simple. It includes some .h files and of course the real work happens in these .h files. Um, then it does some checks, it starts, there's the end, uh, and there's your entire solver. And everything looks like very, very simple. We do a simple corrector for the uh, momentum equations and the pressure equations. You solve the momentum equations, and then you solve the turbulence, and then you write the output. It looks, looks dead simple. But to understand what it's doing, you've actually got to go and look in those .h files. This is what the uh, pressure correction equation looks like. Um, remember what I told you about this thing being templated and abstracted several layers deep? Well, superficially, it's very small, but it's calling a lot of customized procedures that are building blocks to the open foam method to actually do the hard work. So you've got to if you want to make changes, you've got to start drilling down deep into all of those unless you're in a position to accept for the on at face value what it's doing for you here. So yes, open foam is quite easy to write a solver. Um, it's quite hard to understand everything it does. So if anything fails, it may be quite difficult to um, to change. I've opened up a different solver here, which is Ico foam, which is a different um, incompressible solver. It's a transient solver and uh, it, you can see here your transport equation becoming visible. So this is your velocity vector equation. There's your unsteady term. There's your convection term. There's your diffusion term. So all is nicely encapsulated for you and written in vector notation or tensor notation. So in principle, it is quite simple to understand what it does. It solves that equation and then it does some corrector loops. It's when it starts doing the tricky things that you need to do in CFD to get to a solution that it becomes a little bit harder to understand. Um, you need to devote serious time to understanding how to write code inside the OpenFoam framework. OpenFoam has come a very long way since it was originally open sourced around 15 years ago. It was originally a commercial development with the idea of providing a library of routines that developers could use to develop customized solvers. Uh, the commercial model didn't particularly take off, so the decision was made to open source it. And a 
Basically, it's never looked back since then. It's grown tremendously and it's in use, wide use, all over the u world in academia and industry. The different ways that you can use open foam. You can use it as a kind of a black box approach, similar to a commercial program, a commercial solver, with a rather steep learning curve, but it's got the advantage that it parallelizes well, and you don't have to spend the very large amounts of money that you need to spend on commercial software to keep it licensed. The alternative is if you've got special cases that you want to do that do not fit very well in the existing framework or you would like to own the intellectual property of a particular kind of solver or you've got some unusual physics that you want to solve, it's a very good building basis from which you can develop a dedicated customized solver to do a, to do a particular purpose. A lot of the logic that takes up a lot of time in development has been sorted out. A lot of the mathematics are there for you it's effectively standard and out of the box. The boundary conditions are there, the input and outputs are all there, and also even the parallelization. Generally speaking, if you're writing a solver in the open foam framework, you don't need, even need to worry about the parallelization because that's already been taken care of for you. So it is tremendously powerful. The learning curve is steep. So if you decide that you need to use open firm where you might be might foresee a need to use it then you've got to start simple start working with the simple tutorial problems take a look at the documents um, contained in the open foam uh, in the open foam directory under the doc directory there's a directory called guides and there's an open foam user guide in basically formatted for metric a4 or for us letter sized paper it's in PDF format and it's a very good starting place uh, when you start to learn about using um, OpenFoam. It's not one of the greatest works in the annals of uh, software documentation, but it is a starting point. And then you can go onto the World Wide Web and you can find lots of useful information from Google. And you should also take a look at CFD online. Statistically, the chances that you'll encounter a new problem uh, when you start using open foam is quite small. Uh, the world's a very big place and there's a lot of people using the software. So chances are pretty good that somebody else has already asked the question that you now need to ask. And the place to go for this is the open foam forums on cftonline.com. Um, as usual with these kind of form, form, uh, forums, um, it's, uh, there's nobody really watching over them. So your information may or may not be accurate, but it's generally speaking a very good resource for learning how to do things and how to find solutions to problems that you're battling with. Well, all I can say is uh, good luck with Open Firm. Uh, I've been using it for 15 years or so, and it's been very valuable and occasionally extremely frustrating. Good luck. Yeah, thank you very much, Charles, for the for the nice lecture and um, for uh, helping us navigate uh, open foam. So now I'm sure that uh, everybody who will need it knows exactly uh, what to do and how to access it and how to find help if needed. <clears throat> I see that there were already a few questions and comments uh, in in the chat. Uh, I don't know if our listeners have more more questions that they would like to ask now. And 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 Charles, we already have a candidate for the book voucher. Oh, definitely, that will be awkward. So. Okay, 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 perfect. Then, uh, um, uh, please, uh, of course, I'll. Uh, can you kindly type your email in the in the chat so that we can make a record of the of the book voucher and and we can sort it out then uh, next week so I just write down your name ah here we go ah fantastic I think all our participants 
to work for Google. <laughs> yeah. So it's very difficult to find out where people are located because they're all based at, uh, let me check that, yeah, at the Google headquarters. Yeah. Okay, uh, are there more, no, no more urgent questions? <clears throat> Looks like that's it. Charles, it doesn't look like it's uh, it's the case. Then, uh, uh, then now I, I I really have to thank you very very much for your for your time these last two weeks and uh, for preparing a, a very nice set of of lectures. And um, you know now the students know that everything is is documented and on, on on YouTube, so they will also have the opportunity to to watch them again if uh, one day they they remember that <laughs> that they've forgotten something, they know where to where to find it. And I just see that uh, there are some comments in the chat that uh, they enjoyed uh, the lectures very much. So thank you very much <clears throat> for that. And um, yeah, no, and I and I hope that uh, we will keep this interaction uh, going for for many years going going forward. And um, <clears throat> so, really, uh, a, a big thank you, uh, Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, <clears throat> and maybe as a, as a last um, message <laughs> to, to the participants, please tomorrow afternoon we 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 have a a, a short uh, uh, closing uh, function. Uh, to which we have invited also some representative of the Department of Science and Innovation, the director of the CHPC. So please join us for that, and uh, because it would be very nice to show them uh, how many people took part in this um, in this summer school. Yeah, that would be really nice if uh, if you would join. And I know that Benjamin has already shared a few times the the link to register for that session. Uh, so you should all have your the link uh, somewhere in your in your inbox. So please do do register and uh, and join us tomorrow after the lecture of I think it, Ilya is the last speaker. I think after the lecture of Ilya, we will quickly have to switch uh, Zoom link uh, and uh, please join us so that um, so that we are numerous at at, at that event. Yeah. Okay. Then Charles again. Thank you so much. And thank you also to to Andrew for for the assistance with the, with the questions and, uh, and 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 everything. Yeah, and um, yeah, have a good afternoon, and and we will see you tomorrow for the for the last day of the of the summer school. Yeah, and we still have two interesting lectures tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. So everyone has a has a good evening. Yeah, bye, Charles, and thank you very much again. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>